Projector's not on. <laughs> okay, so hello, I'm Mark Jones. I'm from UCL. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I have some applause for that, please. Is there anybody here from New Zealand? No? They said they were going to come. <laughs> so the reason I asked that, they seriously did say they were going to come. So the reason I asked that is because I'm going to talk about a reptile from New Zealand called the Tuatara. It's an animal that's close to my heart. I did my PhD on the Tuatara, and yeah, I still love it. As you can see, it's green. It's got a crest on its head and neck and along its back. It's got a relatively large head and big, adorable brown eyes. When I say I love this animal, I really mean it. <laughs> but if I want you to remember anything from this talk, it's this, that despite appearances, the Tuatara is not a lizard. <laughs> Just in case somebody can't hear. So the Tuatara is not a lizard. It's the only living example of a completely separate lineage that diverged from the lineage that leads to modern snakes and lizards about 250 million years ago. So what that means is that everybody in this room are more closely related to a kangaroo than the Tuatara is to a lizard. Maybe some people more than others. <laughs> oh yeah, I should say, this is supported by both anatomical and genetic data. I know some of you wants to know. <laughs> so this interesting ancestry means the Tuatara is celebrated in New Zealand as an iconic animal, much like the kiwi bird. So you find it featuring on stamps, in the art of the Maori, and souvenirs, and for several years it was on the five cent coin. <coughs> But with this fame, there's also a lot of misconceptions circulating around. So one of these concerns the so-called third eye. Every week on Twitter, someone tweets that the Tuatara has three eyes. I've stopped <coughs> replying to their tweets. <laughs> what this re refers to is a structure on the top of the head that's most clearly seen in juvenile animals, and it is a light-sensitive organ with components that resemble a lens and a retina. But there's absolutely no evidence that this organ can detect movement or form images. So for me, that's not really an eye. What this structure is probably doing is regulating body cycles, breathing cycles, this kind of thing. And rather unexcitingly, it's found in lots of lizards, and even humans have something analogous, but it's covered by bone. So to me, it's not really a big deal. People should stop talking about it. <laughs> the other myth is that the Tuatara doesn't have teeth. This is something you still see in textbooks. It's on lots of websites. I've seen most of them. And these pointy structures in the jaw are instead referred to as serrations on the bone. If you actually take a section through a jaw bone and look at the histology, you find these structures have a pulp cavity, they're made of dentine, and they're covered in enamel. So basically, they're teeth. <laughs> but admittedly, they are attached to the jawbone in quite an interesting way. So they don't have roots like our teeth do, they're fused with hard tissue. So the boundary between the tooth and the bone is very hard to see. But they are still teeth. <laughs> The third misconception is that the Tuatara is unchanged for 200 million years. So this gives the implication that the Tuatara evolved 250 million years ago and then it's been exactly the same ever since, a so-called living fossil, just waiting to appear on the five cent coin. <laughs> Over the last 30 years, the fossil record of its lineage has become much better known. So we know in the Triassic and the Jurassic they were a very diverse group of animals, probably more diverse than the lineage that's leading to lizards and snakes, at least at that time. They include animals doing lots of different things, different body shapes. There's examples of animals that are herbivorous and ones that are aquatic. This is one of the aquatic examples. There's a fossil there on the left. You can see it's very nicely preserved. 
You see, it has very different body proportions from the modern animal, different limb sizes, the streamlined head. So I think it's a bit unfair to refer to two attires being unchanged. Something that is really interesting about the two attire, at least to me, is that it has a very specialised feeding apparatus. So on the roof of the mouth, there is an enlarged tooth row parallel to the outer tooth row, which has two rows of upper teeth. And what this means is when the lower jaw bites, the teeth on the lower jaw bite between the two upper rows of teeth to apply three-point bending to anything in the jaws. But not just that. The shape of the jaw joint means that the lower jaw then also slides forward a few millimetres, so that food trapped within the mouth are torn apart. <laughs> so this is a video of a tuatara in Chester. I overheard someone earlier ask the question, why would anyone go to Chester? So hopefully this video at least explains <laughs> why. <laughs> And you should be able to see that as the tuatara is biting on this cricket, that the lower jaw moves forwards very <coughs> slightly, that tears apart the food in its mouth. So tuatara's chew, which is not something we associate with reptiles, but there are some reptiles that break food down in their mouths so easy to digest. So something I've been doing as part of my research is building biomechanical models out of tuatara heads with colleagues from Colin York. I've already made a joke about Chester, I'm not going to make a joke about Hull. <laughs> so this bow-shaped object represents a piece of food, and the skull is based on a CT scan, so we know it has an accurate shape, and that includes the jaw joint. And the way this model works is we direct the lower jaws to follow an invisible motion marker that reflects how we know the jaws move inside view. But it's using these muscles to actually do that, these springs, that have been placed after anatomical dissections. And we can get a lot of data out of models like this, a lot of numbers, and we can compare which muscle units are working hard at which times and compare that to data taken from living animals when you're allowed to do research like that in the 80s. And what we find is a good correspondence, which is great considering how long we spent building this model. <laughs> you should see the lower jaw does slide forward in the model, which is kind of neat. So this is another view of the model, but here the top part of the skull is invisible, and you're looking down on the lower jaws. So something that we also found in our model is that as the jaws move forwards, they also twist. And this is because of the shape of the jaw joint. So the surfaces are following each other, and as they move forward, they're forced to twist. It's very hard to see this in a living animal because there's bone um, covered by muscle and soft tissue in the way. This is a very subtle, small movement, but it's quite significant considering the size of the teeth. And what this actually means is that when the animal first closes its jaws, the teeth on the lower jaw close against the upper, outer row of teeth, but then as they move forward, they then start to cut against the inner row of upper teeth. So this reduces the amount of surface area that's being worked on by the bite force and improves the cutting efficiency of this mechanism. This is really useful for breaking down your food so you can ingest it more efficiently. And it also allows you to access food that's larger than your gate, and the tuatara is known to attack seabirds and saw their heads off. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a video of this. So in summary, the tuatara is not a lizard. It doesn't have three eyes. It does have teeth. It's not unchanged. It's not a living fossil, but it does chew its food. Thank you very much for listening. was amazing, absolutely brilliant. So I'm more closely related to this than I am a kangaroo. Is that right? No. no. <laughs>